Good morning and welcome to Trade Talks. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. To kick off 2018, we are going to focus on cryptocurrency, which was our hottest topic for 2017. I suspect that trend will continue in the new year. Joining me is David Weisberg, who's the head of equity research over at Viable Markets. David, thank you as always for joining me live over at Market Site. And it's more than just Bitcoin that we're talking about right now. Let's go right into the charts. Let's take a look at Bitcoin versus the US dollar and why you're looking at those two asset classes. Yeah, what's interesting is when you think about cryptocurrencies, the world breaks into two pieces. Piece number one are cryptocurrencies versus what is called fiat. For those who don't understand what fiat means, it means currencies that rely on the full faith and credit of a government. Faith being the operative word, the US dollar is fiat, Japanese yen is fiat, the euro is fiat. So those currencies are Bitcoin, now Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and Ethereum, they all trade versus the US dollar on GDAX, which is owned by Coinbase. Some of them trade on Gemini, on Kraken, etc. And that's the first thing. So Bitcoin versus US dollar, that chart that you're looking at is very interesting because it shows during the period of time that the media was screaming about Bitcoin crashing, and then of course it's subsequently recovering most of, to most of that crash from 16-ish down to 12, and then back up to 15, it was much more orderly than it had been when we talked the last time, when we had 8 or 9% backward markets. Now you see, at times during that chart, you can see some gaps where the blue, which is the bid, is above the offer, which is the orange, and you can see 1% gaps. So the market is still disorganized, but it's less disorganized. So the market is maturing, it's maturing slowly, and it needs software to be able to handle it, which is, you know, the, the charts are produced by coin routes, my new venture to do smart order routing. And that sort of thing will allow people to make that market mature because they can look across and trade reasonably. Now, even when those markets are no longer crossed, there's still a need to trade across multiple markets. And that's why I sent you the second chart, which we right. can talk about. So, so Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Now we're able to, to track and look at two different types of right. cryptocurrency. So Ethereum trades in US dollars, but I thought it would be interesting to look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin mm -hmm. for two reasons. First, you can see over the last month, last week, excuse me, of December, when everyone was sleeping, Ethereum against Bitcoin had a very dramatic rally, right? Extremely large in percentage terms. So you could look at the chart, it's almost straight up. What's really interesting is the market that trades Ethereum versus Bitcoin is far more organized than the market to trade against fiat. Now the reason for this is fairly obvious, and this is my guess, my opinion. My opinion is it's because the fiat is the punters trading on Coinbase and GDAX, the retail, the institutions who have taken in money in dollars, and the trading between the cryptocurrencies is far more professional in the sense of not accredited investors or the way the SEC would look at professional, but people who are in the crypto community. And while those markets really do need more structure, it doesn't get as far out of line. Now, that said, if you look at the, the, if you understand what's going on, there are many more exchanges trading the crypto to crypto pairs like Ethereum versus Bitcoin. And therefore, to find liquidity there, you really do want to have sophisticated tools. But, but the less regulated markets, because it's more regulated or people thinking more about the, the, the fiat, actually are structurally better. And that's a really interesting thought and one that the regulators have to get their heads around as we can talk about. Yeah, we'll talk about that later, but how about Ripple versus Bitcoin? It's a relatively newer one. Ripple is, is a really interesting cryptocurrency because it has really strong backing, a really interesting technology. It does more per second, etc. It might even be a better mousetrap, but from an investment perspective, one really wonders. There's all sorts of commentary about that, and we'll talk about that later, but that chart I showed for a couple reasons. First, it went crazy. It literally doubled in value in a very short period of time. And you can see in Ripple when it did that, there were multiple occasions where the bid got higher than the offer by a huge amount. And every time that it did, it signaled that hmm, it probably got ahead of itself and it came back in. So you get trading signals now out of the bad, you know, the, the bad market structure events that are going on. So I thought that was interesting to show because when you do have extreme volatility in non-Bitcoin, mm -hmm you can see what's going on if you're actually looking at this. Sort so of which stuff. one would you want to own? Well, personally, and I have never been the best prognosticator to say which is the one, but my personal choice is Ethereum for a very simple reason. I'm very easy. I look at things 
is there a use for it? And now, in Bitcoin, as a store of value, I can see a use. In Ethereum, I see a use in smart contracts. People make fun of crypto kitties and other assorted things that are based on Ethereum, but it proves how easy it is to use. And I have heard of hundreds, if not more, projects that want to build smart contracts on what's called ERC-20. Most ICOs are based on ERC-20, which is the, the protocol. And the idea of creating a supercomputer that you can base contracts on, in my brain, has enormous applications in the financial community, derivatives, etc. So to me, that makes more sense. And I know some people who I have a lot of respect for in the community have believed that Ethereum will be worth more than Bitcoin in market cap at some point, even this year potentially. And right now, the last I checked, it was less than a third. What I think is interesting is, regardless of it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, whatever's here to stay, whether it works out or it doesn't, digital currency as an asset class, in my opinion, is something that is going to be a reality for us as investors and as traders. But what's interesting here is that this was a public-led investment versus an institutional-led investment. And, and why do you think that is? Is it because you have the opportunity to get into early stage investing? Is it pent-up demand for the next volatile product? It's so much of what you just said is true. I want to unpack that into a couple of points. The first one, the fact that it's public-led is because there were no institutions in this space. So the fact that it's public-led meant that the barons of, of venture capital, the barons of private equity, the people who are running the banks, for the most part, they recognized cryptocurrency as a threat or they thought it as something to poo-poo even years ago. I made that mistake myself several years ago, so is not understanding it. And if you poo-poo something you don't understand, that's bad on me. Uh, thankfully, I have a son who was able to explain all of this to me, and we're now working together at CoinRoutes to actually make, modernize this market. The market is, as a result, very immature. So you have a notion of the public getting involved directly. That's where the ICO boom comes. I mean, $4 billion in raised money for ICOs recently is a big number. It dwarfs what's being raised in IPOs. In fact, the two can't even be combined, and we'll talk about that. But the fact that the public's leading it is actually a good thing, because we've had years, we've had a 15-year period where wealth inequality is not the only cause, but a cause, is that if you're not connected in the circle of venture capital and private equity, you miss all the early stage equity investment. So now you have 15 years of pent up demand for the average dentist, lawyer, person who used to want to do this sort of thing. I want to invest in something that has some risk with some of my money because I believe in the idea. Now people come along and they see this and they say, ah, here's a way to make money. Now, are all of them right? Of course not. Is there a huge amount of risk? Of course there's a huge amount of risk. It could be in the 90% of amount of failures. But just like in the internet bubble, back then, the public was very involved in early stage investing, in new ideas and new things, in OTC companies or, or, or whatever. But after that, it became almost impossible. Amazon raised money in the public markets. You could get in the public market those triple or quadruple digit percentage gains by investing. Try doing that in Uber. Can your dentist invest in Uber? Right. No. That's the difference. All right, now, now to wrap this all up, you're using a lot of terms that's familiar with equity market structure. And another big conversation is, is this ever going to be regulated? Now, from everything that we've learned, even just in this conversation, it doesn't seem as if you could take equity market structure regulation and apply it to cryptocurrency. Would you agree with that? I think that there are people who believe we should, and those people are, are absolutely wrong, but that's, what, that's the thought. Now, there's a bunch of things in equity market structure that do apply and should be there. First, disclosures. Sure, people should be forced to give risks when they do an ICO and articulate those risks. Second, fraud needs to be prosecuted. If someone says something that isn't true, they should be prosecuted. Third, the idea of trading in an exchange which has some regulation against things like manipulation and wash sales, those are good. Those things make sense. But there's a whole other parts of rules that make no sense. Right. Seasoning. The idea that a security has to be a year old before the founders or other people can trade it forces the buying of shell companies and things that make no sense to the average person means that a new idea to get it funded in the public market can't really happen very well because it's restrictive. Disclosures that are based on companies, well, that's a problem because some of these assets are networks, autonomous networks that will have a value someday led by people who 
are part of it, but they don't have financials. They don't have a chain of command the same way. So expressing it in the equity relationships is just not going to make any sense. And these rules, remember, most of these rules date back to post the Depression. Right. We have a 70 plus year old rules on the books that we're now trying to apply to a technology that wasn't even in the dream sequences of people back then. Right. All right, well thank you very much for joining us at Market Time. I'm sure our conversation next month could be infinitely different than what it is today. It's amazing how quick it changes it, fast. It changes fast. All right, well thank you very much, David. And traders, as always, thank you. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ.